Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Hi, Martin. Hi, Martin. Good evening. Hi, Hello. Martin. Hi, Bronwyn. Hi, Richard. Hi, Junie. Chair, yeah, just to say we've got everybody we're expecting, so at six o'clock you can start if you want to. I will. I'm just checking um, if Bronwyn, Bronwyn's freezing a bit. I think she's all right. Okay. Okay. Well, welcome everyone to the first uh, meeting of Southern Area Planning Committee of 2021. And sadly, we're still in the same position that we were for most of last year, which is having these meetings via Zoom, which isn't my favourite, but there we go. Um, can I remind you all that this is being recorded and streamed live and can I ask you to remember to mute yourselves when you're not speaking please and likewise to unmute when you do want to speak and I'll be the worst culprit probably of that. Um, apologies for absence Lisa. Chairman we have apologies from councillors Baldwin and Owenson. Thank you. And could I have any declarations of interest, please? Nick? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, in relation to item five on the agenda, uh, Adelaide House, uh, I'm chairman of Malvern Hills Trust, a, a neighbouring landowner and an objector to this application. And I therefore declare that as, a, as an other disclosable interest. However, um, it's been confirmed that there is a general dispensation in place for members of the trust, On there. as there is for parish council members, for instance, and I therefore intend to take part and vote on this item. Thank you, Councillor Davis, and, and that presumably applies to the other trust yes. members that we have as well. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Councillor Rain, you have your hand up. Same chair. I'm a Malvern Hills Trust trustee. Um, and I'd like to take part. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Um, anybody else? Any comments on that? Declaring any interest? I do have to declare an interest. Um, I've been advised that I need to declare a non-pecuniary interest um, in relation to item six, in that Mr Barnes, one of the objectors, is known to me. So I think I declare an interest at most meetings now for one reason or another. Um, OK, so thank you very much for that. Confirmation of previous minutes. Oh, uh, Councillor Gallagher, you've got your hand up. Yes, I actually know Dr Barnes from a long time back. So in the sense that uh, I'm aware of one of the objectors from the work environment when I used to work, but that's, uh, that's more than 15 years ago. Thank you, John. Yes, uh, we, we both know Dr Barnes then. Thank you. Um, confirmation of previous minutes. Unless anyone has any comments or objections, uh, I'll take the minutes as a true record. Can I see anybody with a hand up? No? Okay. In which case, could I ask for a show of hands, please, to accept the minutes as a true record? Could you pop your hands up, please? Thank you. That's unanimous, Chair. Thank you, Penny. That's great. Okay. Um, Chairman's announcements. Uh, we join this evening by several members of the public who will be speaking on items five and six on the agenda. So I'd like to welcome all of those members of the public to the meeting. Um, you're very, very welcome. And officers who are present tonight are Duncan Rudge, Planning Services Manager, Kieran Power, Area Planning Officer, Simon Rolls, Senior Planning Officer, Chris Lewis Farley, Landscape Officer, Penny James, Solicitor, and Lisa Perks, Democratic Services Officer. Could I remind all members that should you wish to speak on items five or six, please put your hand up so that myself or Lisa can see you clearly. A reminder that on items five and six, Penny will ask each member to vote uh, in alphabetical order. And finally, just a note to remind you that there's a mandatory planning training session on affordable housing on the 10th of March, which I currently have in my diary as starting at 6pm. But if we have a, an SAPC in February, I'll remind you again. 
Okay, I'll now move on to the schedule of planning applications. And the first one is item five on pages 19 to 48, uh, which is Adelaide House, planning reference 20-01304, full. And Simon, could I turn to you please to um, start your presentation? Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, okay, uh, this application relates to a proposal to convert a large attractively designed building into eight open market apartments. Uh, the building is situated in West Malvern uh, and was last occupied as a care home. If we can move on to the next slide, please. Okay, uh, so you can see from the, the map on the left that the site lies, um, if I just highlight it with my cursor, you can see it's this uh, yellow blob on the map, uh, which is in West Malvern, the main urban area. Um, it is accessed off Park Road, which feeds onto West Malvern Road, which obviously runs around the hills. Um, the access does cross Malvern Hills Trust land, as we've already alluded to in the preamble. Um, and obviously the site falls within the Malvern Hills area of outstanding natural beauty. Okay, uh, it forms part of the wider grounds to the building uh, that are shown in blue on the map on the right. Uh, so you can see the red edged application site in red and uh, the land within the control of the, of the applicant in blue, which is rooftop housing. If we can move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so this aerial photo is just included to give you a little wider context. You can clearly make out the, um, the natural features of the area, the woodland um, and the verdant qualities of, of the, the wider context. Um, access comes across, if I show you with the mouse cursor again, you can see this is Park Road here. And access comes across this trust land to Adelaide House, which is the building in the centre of the aerial photo. Okay, um, in terms of the parking area currently serving the building, that lies to the south of Adelaide House around here. And West Malvern Road, you can see just coming north to south down here to the east of the site. Okay, if we can move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so this um, top left hand corner is the schedule of accommodation. Um, essentially, it's a proposal for one and two bed apartments, uh, eight in total, um, and occupancy would be up to 20 individuals. Um, in terms of the site layout plan you see here, um, obviously access across the trust land, uh, residents would have to come across um, this existing driveway into a, an extended parking area, uh, which lies, as I say, to the south of Adelaide House. Um, and I'll go into some detail in, on that in a, in a short while. Uh, there is also a passing bay that I should just highlight here along, along that driveway. Um, and, and there's 11 parking spaces. Uh, onto the next slide, please. Okay, so just, just to briefly touch on that enlarged parking area, um, there would be some retaining works required uh, in the form of a wall and a, a crib lock um, timber feature. Uh, the aspiration there was to try and avoid a very stark um, engineered appearance. So um, we've, we tried to vary that through use of materials. Um, there would be some tree uh, removal involved, um, but the landscape officer comments received indicated that the trees that would need to be removed are not of significant amenity value and that other um, more noteworthy trees can be protected. Um, okay, so there's just a couple of photos at the bottom showing the, the, the host building Adelaide House and the um, a sample of, of what the, uh, the crib block walling may look like. Uh, if we can go on to the next slide, please. Okay, there's not much to, to talk about here. The external appearance of the building will, will largely remain the, the same. There's a, just a couple of alterations to allow for, for a fire escape um, and another window in this elevation over here. But, but largely speaking, you won't notice any change to the external appearance of the building. On to the next slide, please. Uh, there's four slides, I'm afraid, with, with floor plans on 
and which I, I don't intend to dwell on. Um, I'm, I'm obviously happy to come back to them uh, as the matter is debated if, if necessary. Um, essentially, these um, show that the building is encompassed over four floors um, and that there would be five one bed apartments and three two bed apartments. Um, if I just um, ask Chris to cycle through the next three slides. Thank you, Chris. And, and yeah, okay, we're on to the photos now. Um, so this photo here at the top left is showing a, a, the rear of the building, as it were, um, upslope from that. And you've got the listed gas lamp just, just situated here on, on land outside of the site area. Um, the photo top right is from the other side to the garden side. Um, bottom left is the existing or part of the existing driveway. Um, and you would you would come around there to the to the sort of south of the building with the new parking area. Um, this aspect here, bottom right, is perhaps um, one of the less attractive um, aspects of the building um, next to the existing parking area. Uh, next slide, please, Chris. OK, um, I just included a few photos. Um, there had been some local concerns of a parking and access. And obviously this is um, this slide shows you the access across the trust land, the existing um, surface and steps down to Park Road bottom right. Um, I should say the there is there are some updates rather which have hopefully been circulated in advance of the meeting. Um, on there, just just to summarise, there's a couple of adjustments to conditions three and sixteen as set out in the officer report. Also, we we also we received an objection um, from a local resident. Um, which has been summarised on there and a brief um, response from an officer perspective. Um, please let me know if there's any queries on that. Uh, the overall recommendation is for approval and I'm happy to answer any questions as they arise. Thank you, Chair. Can we take the screen sharing off, um, please? Thank you. And I've noted that there are four members who haven't got their screens on. Ah, oh, thank you. Um, please, could I remind you that you really must have your screens on unless you've let me know beforehand that there's a reason why you uh, aren't able to this evening. So thank you. Um, I've still got a couple, I think. Um, anyway, thank you. If you could put your screens on, that's great. Um, thank you, Simon, for your report. That was very good. Can I um, invite... Councillor Andy Turner um, to speak, who's representing West Morgan Parish Council. Um, thank you, Councillor Turner. Sorry, Chair, he's just joining us now. Thank you, Lisa. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes thank you, yes. Brilliant. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Andy Turner, Chairman of West Morgan Parish Council, and uh, these are our comments regarding the planning application for Adelaide House on uh, Park Road. So the Parish Council objects to this planning application. We believe the layout and density of the proposed development is inappropriate. The issues created by overdevelopment within the site boundary will also have an adverse impact on the local area. Also, the Parish Council does not agree with the case officer's appraisal in his draft report to the committee on a number of points. We note the site has been referred to as Brownfield, but it does not appear on the District Council's Brownfield land register. The parking provision, whilst in line with the minimum planning policy requirements, is minimal and we question whether the spaces are of an adequate size. Turning provision is also very limited for some of these spaces. The access track has several narrow points and only a single passing place. Coupled with the long single access track road, this will create issues with vehicle flow. This is in the context of car sized vehicles. For larger vehicles, such as delivery vans, access will prove difficult or impossible. There is no visitor parking provision, which can be provided on the public road in some circumstances, as noted in the case officer's report. However, in cases where there is on-street demand or parking restrictions, this should be provided on the site. As a member of the West Morven Parish Council for many years, I can state that one of the regular issues we deal with is increasing street parking demand and the issues arising from it. Coupled with the road layout and park road with its multiple junctions and reduced visibility, this development will only add to this burden. The Parish Council notes the provision for bin storage is too small. For eight residences, this would equate to 16 wheelie bins or similar. 
bike provision should be for 11 cycles. And whilst this may be adequate from the plans, it is not, as it should be according to planning policy, easily accessible through its position down a flight of steps. The internal layout of the proposed dwellings also appears cramped and the plans do not convey the additional space restrictions from the design of the building with its many dormer windows on the top floor. The developer points out that not all the units comply with the nationally described space standard and whilst this standard is not formally adopted, this further supports the view that the density of this development is inappropriate. In conclusion, the Parish Council objects to the proposal as it stands. The financial contributions from this development, some of which would likely come to our parish where the additional pressure on the local infrastructure would be, will not in any way offset the longer term issues we will have to deal with in this regard. We do not agree that the public benefit of these contributions weighs in favour of the grant of permission. If permission cannot be rejected at this meeting, then could the committee at least consider deferral to allow a proper site visit in order to understand the setting of the development, which cannot be con conveyed adequately through plans and drawings. Thank you very much. Mr. Turner, could I just ask Councillor Dye, please, if he could um, put his camera on. Um, please. Thank you, Mark, that's brilliant, thank you. Um, okay, so um, I'd like to ask Mr. Richards to speak now, and I understand, Mr. Richards, that you're speaking on behalf of several um, residents. Uh, thank you. Sorry, Chair, he's just coming through now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Mr. Richards. Good evening. I understand uh, that you're speaking on behalf of several re residents tonight, so um, ready when you are. Okay, thank you. I, I, first of all, I want to start, I've represented quite a few here. I think I was just the first person to put their name down, hence why I've been, uh, uh, I've got the slot. Uh, I haven't spoken to Mr. Turner. I don't know Mr. Turner, but it sounds like I'm saying uh, some things to him. Okay, I've written a few things down here. So. Uh, the community uh, have real concerns over the development of Adelaide. Uh, it's got significant potential for accidents and harm to the residents of the community. It's a unique historical building in a quiet and uh, area of outstanding natural beauty. It's not a brownfield site. Uh, rooftop housing are clearly trying to force a square peg into a round hole here. Excessive flats will create daily risks. The build is not future proof. Everything seems to be squeezed in. Inadequate parking that is not extensive. There's no turning space resulting in excessive reversing. There's no disabled parking, no disabled access to the gardens uh, or property. And there's one token electric vehicle charging point that is uh, communal. Uh, the parking bay measurements are not shown on the plans. The measurements uh, are not included because they don't fit the necessary size. Uh, a vehicle reversed into bay six has the potential to block a fire escape by way of inconsiderate parking due to these small bays. There's no mention as well on there of the old gate pillar at the car park entrance. It's a three meter entrance and only 2.8 meters at the top of the pillar. Right. This building overhangs and would prevent emergency vehicles accessing the car park. The over density creates environmental concerns. Too many flats uh, increase noise and light pollution. Multiple occupancy results in multiple deliveries. Morrison's, FedEx, Orcado, Amazon. This delivery culture didn't exist when Adelaide was a quiet nursing home. A 26 ton, 10 and a half meter refuge lorry has no turning area. The 26 ton vehicle will need to reverse from Park Road along the narrow track, a distance of 110 meters, in order to collect refuge from four 1,000 litre refuge bins at the site entrance. This will clearly be repeated for the separate garden waste collection but there's no mention of these waste bin areas. This track is a popular place to walk and cycle and used daily by families going to and from school. There is a separate ancient pathway that runs directly outside the main gate. The path is a favorite with walkers. This consideration is being given to, uh, to register this path uh, to connect the hills to the Worcestershire Way. All visiting vehicles will need to drive across that public footpath. Highways England fails to mention the lack of lighting. 
and it's not grasped the reversing dangers of refuse lorries and multiple vehicles crossing and reversing down this track. This is not a highway, it's a narrow track with no lighting. It's a 19th century track that is not designed to accommodate large lorries. Reversing lorries in daytime is difficult. At nighttime, it's both difficult and dangerous. Where we, um, it looks good that the bike store uh, is in included, but it's down a three meter descent. That's dangerous. Access is unrealistic for the elderly and less able. And this does not meet that set criteria. Accountability. As mentioned of Article 8 of the Human Rights Act, right to respect for a private and family life. And the law provides the right to deny planning permission where the reason for doing so is related to public interest. It is in the interest, public interest, for the committee to deny the application and reduce the flat numbers. This will protect the absolute rights of the community and the new community who will eventually live at Adelaide. Furthermore, Article 6 of the Human Rights Act supports the right to a fair and public hearing. Due to the over density of the flats, it is in the public interest to provide protection from those significant rights that have been highlighted. Sorry, the significant risks that have been highlighted. These safety measures can only be appreciated by a visit, not by a cut and paste, not by a Zoom meeting. We respectfully request that the chair and committee move for a deferment so that the co committee can actually visit the venue and fully understand these safety issues that we're highlighting. We're raising these as genuine points for the community and the future residents of Adelaide. A deferral to allow both night and daytime visits is proportionate, legal and necessary in these circumstances. Thank you, Mr Richards. Um, could I now turn to uh, Rebecca Pitt? Rebecca Pitt, is she live with us, Lisa? He's just coming through now. Thank you. Yeah, I think we might have lost her. Give it, give it a minute, Lisa, see if we can get her back. Oh, yeah, I think she's just coming now. Okay. There she is. Good evening. Oh, welcome, Rebecca. <laughs> Can I just introduce you? Uh, Rebecca is Head of Programme Delivery for Rooftop Housing. So if you'd like to um, say a few words, Rebecca, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good evening. Um, on behalf of Rooftop Housing Group, I, I'm pleased to speak in support of this change of use application. Um, Rooftop acquired this property 10 years ago when it was, it was a care home. And whilst in a fabulous location, the layout of the building was unsuitable for occupation by older people as, as wheelchairs and mobility equipment could not be used due to the number of steps and narrow staircases. And res residents were subsequently relocated to more suitable accommodation. In 2014, we commenced work on a project to bring the property back into use as a facility to support ex-service personnel but despite our best efforts, this project stalled and ultimately did not proceed due to lack of funding or care provider. It's with regret that the building has fallen into disrepair and is now classed as a long-term empty property. Care provision has moved on over the last 10 years to models of independent living and therefore the building's current use class as a residential institution is not compatible with current practices. This change of use application has therefore been submitted with the interest of restoring and refurbishing this property to provide eight one and two bed self-contained apartments. The scheme is designed to return this 19th century building back to its former glory. The scheme will offer well-designed accommodation which will benefit from much improved thermal insulation. The external elevations have intentionally been left largely untouched to minimise the visual impact of the proposals. 
with the only external change being the introduction of the retaining wall in the grounds to create the communal parking area. This application does follow the withdrawal of a previous application, which comprised nine apartments and was withdrawn due to concerns regarding lack of sufficient parking. Following extensive consultation with highways and planners, this revised application addresses that issue by reducing the number of apartments to eight and providing 11 parking spaces in the much improved layout. On-street car parking is also available on West Malvern Road for visitors. This proposal is acceptable to highways and planners, and we will gladly work with local neighbours and landowners where possible to minimise parking concerns through the marketing and management of the homes. We have carried out a significant number of surveys to deal with matters of heritage, ecology, arboriculture, um, drainage and transport, and the proposed restoration and refurbishment of this building ensures that historical features are in, retained and that it fits in well with its stunning natural surroundings and nearby residential properties. The proposed change of use will give this long-term empty property the best possible chance of being brought back into use and preserve the future of Adelaide House for many years to come by providing eight new homes in this great location. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I'll turn now to the ward members. Uh, I think Councillor Rain, you'd like to start? Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, uh, this has not been an easy application to consider. Adelaide, Adelaide House is a wonderfully quirky arts and craft dwelling. I understand the home of one Captain Jackson for many years and which then became a Red Cross care home, as you've heard, for elderly residents, and which was very much valued as a very happy community facility within the village of West Malvern. Indeed, I used to take my voluntary choir carol singing to Adelaide, uh, congregating in the large sitting room around the piano there in the run up to Christmas, followed by sherry and mince pies for residents, carers and singers alike. But then it closed and under rooftop succeeding ownership, it was initially, as you've heard, destined to become a residential centre for veterans recovering from P PTSD before that plan was dropped. And the building has remained empty and sadly forlorn for quite a, num forlorn for quite a number of years since. So I think probably I speak for the whole of West Malvern when I say that the village is very pleased that there are at last fresh plans to refurbish and reawaken Adelaide House and to provide additional homes within our community. However, a key issue that looms large in my view of those plans, which are for eight apartments within the existing curtilage, is the space provision for residents parking and vehicle manoeuvring on site. In this respect, for me, the plans do raise significant questions about the workability of the planned provision. Indeed, questions about vehicles having to cross stretches of driveway, which show clear signs of underlying tree roots pushing up the tarmac. This application, and particularly the provision for vehicle parking and movements, is one with which I really think all members of this committee need to acquaint themselves thoroughly before deciding it. The officer's report acknowledges the constraints of the site and particularly its provision of parking for 11 residents' cars. But here it should be said that five one-bedroom departments and three two-bedroomed ones could ge well generate in excess of 16 resident-owned vehicles, to say nothing of visitors' vehicles, the various delivery vehicles that will be calling, the latter of which will surely have to reverse out along the narrow driveway, then, as you've heard, along the track owned by Malvern Hills Trust before having to exit onto Park Road in reverse gear. Particularly because of these constraints, I feel it is most appropriate today to recommend a deferment of the application to allow appropriate COVID secure arrangements to be made for each member of our committee to visit the site and to understand for themselves whether those constraints are acceptable or otherwise for an eight apartment development. I so move, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rain. Um, could I ask Councillor McVeigh now to speak as the uh, other ward member? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, colleagues, officers and members of the public. Yes, um, I'm more than happy to second Councillor Rain's proposal to defer this application so that my fellow councillors are able to visit this site. 
I won't say much more than that at this point, but I would like to reserve the right to speak again following the outcome of the forthcoming vote. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so we have a proposal uh, from Councillor Rain, which is to defer the decision tonight, and that's been seconded by Councillor McVeigh. Um, and the reason for the deferment is to um, enable a site visit to take place, which no normally would take place before a committee, but I understand uh, the, the reasons for this tonight. Um, given the concerns raised by ward members, um, I think this is a, a sensible course of action. However, I'm just going to check with Penny, um, our solicitor, that this is an appropriate way to move forward. Penny, could I have a view from you, please? Thank you, Chair. Yes, it is an appropriate um, uh, motion to put forward. Um, however, I would say that we need to take the vote on that proposal before you open the debate. So um, if it is um, passed, then there is no issue of the debate having opened before a site visit starts. Thank you, Penny. Um, in which case, um, John, would you like to just reiterate your proposal for us? Uh, yes, Chair, that uh, we defer the application and arrange, obviously in difficult times, but ar make arrangements for every member, either together or separately, certainly socially distanced, um, to visit the site and have a tour at least of the outside. It might be the opportune time to look inside as well, but as I said, my concerns are primarily about the, uh, the site layout. And it will be evident then, I think, to members what, what some of the concerns you've heard about tonight really represent. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you, Councillor Ray. In which case, I'll move to the vote. Uh, so the vote is for a deferment to allow a site visit. Um, Penny, could I ask you to uh, call out the names alphabetically and then record the vote? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'll just clarify that... Um, we're deferring it to come back to a, a later committee, not necessarily the next committee. Yep. Um, I don't know how long it's going to take the planners to um, organise a COVID secure site visit, but I should um, um, advise you that when the uh, application comes back to, the, to the, the later committee, the same speaking arrangements will apply. So everyone who has spoken tonight, if they wish to, to come back and speak again, they are able to, or if someone else wants to take the slot, that is possible. Okay, thank you, councillors. I'll now take the vote. As usual, I will call out your name and if you could clearly say whether you're voting for, against or abstaining. And this is for the deferral to allow a site visit. Councillor Axel. For. Councillor Allen. For. Councillor Behan. Abstain. Councillor Bennett. Uh, four. Councillor Bovey. Four. Councillor Chan. Four. Thank you. Councillor Davis. Four. Councillor Died. Four. Councillor Gallagher. Four. Councillor Mills? Four. Councillor McVeigh? Four. Councillor Morgan? Four. Councillor Nielsen? Um, is it possible to ask a question? Um, not really now that the vote's begun. Um, it's just that I didn't know what there was, whether there was a time limit on the deferment. No, there won't, there won't be. I mean, officers will work as quickly as they can um, to arrange the site visit, which we would ask them to do. And then obviously there will need to be uh, probably some changes to some of the report. So I think we can't put a time scale on it, but we hope that it wouldn't be too long. I, would I think hope that's right, Duncan. Did you want to comment on that at all? Thank you, Chairman. That's right. Um, without knowing what the uh, outcome of the committee site visit might be and uh, whether we have to, in order to keep numbers um, small, uh, or possibly arrange uh, a number of site visits, it's difficult to put a timescale on it. Thank you. Well, 
on the assumption that reasonable efforts are made for it to be timely, I would vote for. Thank you. Councillor Palmer. For. Councillor Rain. For. Councillor Reid. For. Councillor Whitehead. For. And Councillor Wood. For. Thank you, councillors. Point of order, Chair. Can I just um, point out that some of us are shielding to some degree, you know, trying to do all that. How can that, how, how can those people be able to go? And will that be borne in mind, just as a matter of interest? Um, okay, well, we'll try. I think the answer is we'll try and do the best we can, uh, Councillor Bennett. Um, Duncan's got his hand up, so I'll ask Duncan to say a few words. Thank you, Chairman. Um, very briefly, um, as in normal circumstances, members aren't required to attend the committee site visit. Um, some may feel that they're unable to or it's um, ill-advised, um, and, and that's for each individual member, but um, we will arrange one or a number of committee site visits. We'll try and keep the numbers uh, small and we'll make sure that those are COVID secure, social distancing is maintained, um, and members will we need to wear masks. Um, we've organised some site visits for Northern Area Committee, uh, and that's been very successful. So I, I don't foresee any major problems, but it's a good point that Councillor Bennett has raised. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Councillor Bennett, for raising that, because that was an important point. Um, Councillor Rain, you've got your hand up as well. Thank you, Chair. It's just a suggestion, but I think it'd be very helpful if our planners could, uh, perhaps with, with tape or something, mark out where the parking bays will be, the lines for the 11 spaces, because I think that is the critical issue in relation to manoeuvrability that I talked about. And I don't think that would be a problem. Uh, I've seen the site and I, I know what it looks like, but I think it'd be much easier if members could see white lines on the ground or some way of determining what it might look like. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Ryan Duncan. Would you like to respond to that, please? Thank you, Chairman. It's something we can ask the applicant to do now that we know that that's a key issue. Thank you. Thank you, that's super. Thank you, Duncan. Okay, so um, we'll move on to the next item. On uh, the can I just oh, confirm sorry. before we move on? Sorry, yes, sorry Penny. that was for 17-4 um, with one abstention. So the motion to defer to allow a site visit is passed. Thank you, Penny. I forgot we hadn't done that bit in all the following <laughs> up discussion. Um, okay, so can we move on now to item six, which is confirmation of tree preservation order 668 2020, which is at 28 Peachfield Road. And the report is on pages 49 to 82. Um, I'm just waiting for the screen sharing to start. Thank you. Could I ask Chris, uh, would you be able to uh, start your discussion on the report now, please, Chris? Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, initially, an apology. Uh, my carefully prepared notes, which are on my work laptop, um, are, are unfortunately inaccessible. Um, the RIT system has uh, uh, kicked me out and, uh, and, and it's, it's not letting me back in. So. Uh, forgive me in, in advance uh, if, if I miss out any, any points that I uh, should have raised during the course of my presentation. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to uh, remember what I, um, what I prepared to say. Um, in the first instance, if I can draw uh, Council's attention to the uh, update sheet, uh, we had a, 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 another uh, representation uh, this week um, from one of the, the previous objectors uh, the representation is uh, explained is um, is laid out in full uh, in the update sheet. Um, if you uh, would like to have a look at that, um, and also uh, I, I'd like to um, uh, apologise for a couple of uh, minor inaccuracies that uh, uh, were in uh, my report um, uh, while while looking at the site today. Uh, I realised that the uh, the size of the site. Um, uh, just detailed in the report. I'm afraid I don't have the reference number of the section. Uh, the, the site is actually considerably larger than um, uh, made mention of in the report. 
Um, it's uh, 5,200 meters, 200 square meters, uh, rather than I think it was uh, 3,400, something like that. Um, meaning that the uh, canopy, the tree, the tree accounts for um, two percent of the overall site area, rather than four uh, percent, as it's mentioned in the report. Um, uh, the other minor area is in the um, uh, the sections of the uh, section of the report uh, toward, but towards the very end. Um, I, I inadvertently put uh, um, uh, referred to Great Morven Conservation Area. Uh, rather than um, Morgan Wells Conservation Area, which is obviously where the uh, uh, where the site is. Okay, moving on to the presentation. Um, uh, here, here is the site uh, shown on the screen. Um, the site is um, shown in blue. Uh, you can see uh, immediately next to Peachfield Road uh, and the common to the north. Uh, the Wells Road is on the uh, left-hand side of the screen, running, running north-south. Um, this is a, a closer view of the site. Um, 28 uh, is obviously the uh, one in blue. Uh, we have received representations from uh, number 26, uh, which is the site to the left um, of, of the blue line. Uh, the two red blobs are um, the, the tree is covered by the tree preservation order. Um, T1 is the, uh, the, the, the one on the uh, western boundary of the site, to, immediately to the southwest uh, of the applicant's property. Uh, G1, uh, which contains the lime and the maple, uh, is on the uh, northern boundary. Here's uh, an aerial view, um, same site, same scale, just to sort of give you an idea of uh, what's, uh, what's going on on the site. Um, uh, the next image is um, with the uh, red colouring of the trees removed, just to sort of give you an idea of the uh, size and scale uh, of the trees concerned. Um, the tree preservation order was created uh, following receipt of a conservation area notification uh, for tree works. Um, the conservation area notification was for uh, the removal of four trees. Um, um, two, two of the trees that were part of that conservation area notification uh, were, we didn't oppose um, for various reasons. Um, the structure of one of them was quite poor, quite, quite a large tree, um, but uh, um, it, it, it didn't meet up to the standards uh, required for uh, protection by uh, tree preservation order. Um, two of the other trees that were in that original conservation notification, uh, uh, the red oak, uh, which is uh, to, the, to, uh, to the left of the, uh, the image, uh, and the lime tree, uh, which is the uh, uh, towards the top at uh, the north of the site uh, were, were considered to be uh, worthy of TPO. Now the, uh, the lime tree to the north um, grows uh, in close proximity to, the, uh, uh, to a red maple and you can you can see the redness of the maple uh, just to the left of the green canopy of the lime um, and because those two trees grew, uh, grow so, uh, so close together uh, they uh, were, were uh, thought to um, be, it was best best to consider those two trees as a group, uh, hence the uh, group designation of that particular bit of the tree preservation order. Now the, um, the conservation area notification uh, suggested that the, the lime tree should be uh, removed uh, to, to favour the maple, um, but as the, uh, the maple was the, the lesser uh, of, the, of the two trees, um, uh, uh, if anything, it, sh it should have been the other way around, uh, the maple being removed um, rather than the lime. Um, but we decided, but because as they are, um, they form a, have been growing as a group for so long, uh, be uh, best, best to keep the two trees um, rather than have uh, one tree either very, di very distorted or one with a, a hole in the side of the canopy. Um, 
this is a view of T1. This is the uh, the red oak. Um, this is taken as it as the, you can see on the screen uh, from the, within the garden of uh, 26 Peachfield Road um, during site visit uh, at the invitation of the uh, uh, the owners of uh, uh, number 26. It's number 26 on the left. Um, uh, the tree owner's property is uh, uh, just off, uh, off screen to the, to the right. Um, this is a view um, looking uh, roughly from the north, uh, just inside of the drive. Again, uh, 26 Peachfield Road is on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, 28 tree owner's property is on the uh, left. Um, See at this, this time of day um, that the tree does uh, cast a little bit of shade um, on, uh, on number 28 at least. Um, and this is a view from a public perspective. Um, I mean, as, as highlighted in one of the uh, objectors um, uh, letters that they submitted, this is a, uh, there's a well used path um, very close to the front of these properties. So uh, where uh, views of the tree such as this um, would be enjoyed. Um, this is uh, G1, um, the, uh, um, the, 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 bulk, the bulk of the, the tree in that image, that's the, that's the, that's the lime. And you can see that the, uh, on the right hand side, that's the maple. As you can see, they're sort of, uh, they together form a quite a pleasing uh, collective outline. Uh, hence the uh, group designation. Um, um, view, this is from uh, the other side of Peachfield Road, um, standing on the common. Again, you can see from, the, from this perspective, uh, uh, the, the maple takes up um, more of the image. Uh, but again, you can see uh, it, it's, it's critical that the two uh, remain uh, together because as I say, together they, they make a nice, there's a nice outline, but uh, if we remove the one, it's going to be uh, considerably uh, to, to, to public detriment. And this is a view of the same group from slightly further up the road. Okay, um, trees were assessed using the uh, council's uh, uh, amenity evaluation system. Um, there has been some discussion about this uh, um, by, by email. Um, the, the system that the council uh, has adopted uh, um, before uh, before I started in post uh, is a version of the uh, Heliwell system. Um, it's not uh, exactly the same. Uh, it uses all the criteria, um, but the uh, the scoring uh, with the, the, the we use is cumulative rather than uh, scores being uh, multiplied uh, together. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's been a system we've um, used. Uh, it's, it's very, very useful, but we've applied it consistently and it's been uh, um, uh, great uh, to assist in uh, decisions as to uh, levels of public amenity. Um, although, although public visibility is uh, one aspect of the system, uh, there are many others, uh, including uh, that, that we look at uh, when looking at an overall score. Uh, one is uh, potential amenity value, as in like, uh, if other trees were removed in the locale, uh, would um, the trees concerned become more visible? Um, another is the uh, structure, uh, structural quality of the tree. Um, and another, just for the sake of illustration, is uh, life expectancy. Uh, and as uh, the, the, these trees concerned are young mature, then obviously they've got a, a plenty of life ahead of them. Um, I think that's all I'd like, I'd like to say at the moment. Um, obviously, uh, if you have any questions, um, uh, either uh, about what I just talked about in my presentation or the contents of the report, uh, I will uh, try and answer them. Uh, obviously, without the, <laughs> the benefit of the documents which are on my computer, which uh, uh, which I won't let me in. So, uh, uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Chris. Could you um, stop the screen sharing for us now, please? Um, and Lisa, we have uh, Mr. Payton, who's the owner of the trees, uh, coming to speak to us now. Is Mr. Payton on? Ah, oh, yes, I can Just see. Just coming through, Chair. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Payton. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you. Would you like to um, start? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, and, uh, Chair, and uh, good evening, councillors. Um, before I start with what I wanted to say, I need to point out a significant error in the tree officer's presentation just made. The aerial view with a blue line delineating our property included the, neighbor, the neighboring nurseryman's plot as part of our property. It's not, it's his, nothing to do with us. It was sold by a previous owner of our house to the nurseryman way before we arrived here 35 years ago. So our property is smaller than has been stated and also the figures that have been given by the tree officer, um, at, at the revised figures he gave at the beginning of the presentation must therefore uh, be incorrect as well. I'd like to make it clear that we like trees, particularly deciduous trees that mark the seasons with displays of color and profile. I'd like to deal quickly with the field maple and lime, which is G1 in your photo pack. We apply to move, remove the lime to let the maple develop as there are other lines on the common a few yards away and the maple improves color variety. We don't mind which of the two is removed if one can go to give the other a chance. As the tree officer's view is that the lime is the better tree, we'd like to be able to remove the maple. I want to focus mainly, however, on the red oak, which is T T1 in your photo pack. I would add that our neighbours, Dr. and Mrs. Barnes in number 26, fully support us on the matter, which affects us both. The tree is not marked on the Wells Conservation Area appraisal map as a tree of significance. Its visibility from outside the two properties is very limited, as is therefore its public amenity value, its contribution to the Malvern treescape and to the Wells Conservation Area, which are the grounds for the provisional TPO as stated up to us in the original letter. Uh, both ward councillors and one of the other councillors have kindly been to see the Red Oak from inside our property. But I would point out that before making the order, the tree officer, and indeed after making the order, the tree officer has never inspected the tree from inside our property. This morning, for the first time, I saw the amenity score, score sheet used by the tree officer to determine the imposition of the TPO. The threshold is, is 15. On his score, the red oak marginally makes it across that threshold at 15.5, 15.5. It has been given two out of four for visibility, that is view only slightly blocked, whereas it should be one or 1 1.5 at the most. No score has been given for effect on neighboring structures. The shadows cast by this tree at different times of day on both ours and our neighbors' buildings are significant and detrimental. So it should be given at least minus one for a sli for, for which, which is a slight effect and possibly more. Trees grow and may get too large for the site. So I doubt if anyone would now advise planting a red oak in such a position as, as this on the boundary and in a corner beside buildings, giving it a score of two out of four for suitability of location which is, quote, fairly suitable. Statistic appraisal would give it a total score well below the TPO threshold. It is, of course, difficult to make that judgment if you don't visit the site. Only the negative impact of the removal of one tree is considered, but please balance this with the positive impact of all our new plantings over the years, including a Colroyteria, a catalpa, cladestris, liquid ambar, and several aces, prunus, and sorbus, some 20 new trees in all. There is another oak inside our boundary with the common, which is fully visible from outside, and I would assure you that we have no intention of doing anything to that one. Mr. Payton, uh, Mr. Payton sorry to step in, but you've had uh, well over your three minutes now, so if yes, you mind, thank you. Madam Chair, I, I had to add a little bit at the beginning, which That's I unexpected. Can I finish? 
Yes, yes, if you wind up those now. If you Thank can, you. Thank if you. we could take down the red oak, we would continue with our specimen tree planting with one or more replacements. We'd like to add a uh, ginkgo biloba, for example. We are not developers knocking down trees to fit in more buildings. We're householders creating and managing a diverse, interesting and appropriate garden treescape. Please allow us to do that. We would submit that the case for the TPOs has not been made. Thank you, Chair. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Payton. Thank you. I'm sorry to have um, tried to cut you short, but uh, you, were, you were well over four minutes by then. Thank you very much. Um, OK, could I turn now to the ward councillors, please? Councillor Gallagher, I think you want to go first. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Chris Lewis Valley for his report uh, on this. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Simon Payton for uh, allowing me to visit uh, and go around his back garden area and see all the things that he's been doing. I was actually very impressed at the time. It was back in the summer when I went around and I saw the neatness and care and consideration that he'd given to all the planting and the maintenance of it. Uh, it's a very interesting area and it's done very interesting work already. Uh, I want to uh, look at, there's two aspects to applications that were, were put up in front of us here. Councillor Gallagher, we, we're losing you a bit and there's a, quite a bit of interference on the mic. Can you hear me better? That's better, that's better, that's brilliant, thank you. Well, I want to look at the, the, the two TPOs separately, so I shall cover first of all the red oak, uh, the Quercus rubra, and then I shall come on to the, the question of uh, the lime and the Acer Capestra, the field maple. The red oak uh, is a, a large tree, it's about 80 years old. And it's actually growing quite close to both number 26, Dr. Bard's house, uh, and to 28 Peachfield Road, which is Mr. Payton's house. It's actually in the northwest corner of, of number 28. It's about two metres from the boundary between uh, the two houses. And it's about four metres or four and a half metres from the integrated greenhouse uh, and garage of number 28. Now, it seems to, it's grown to about 10 metres in height. Uh, and in fact, it pinches upon and causes significant shading to both properties. The, uh, the oak tree, oak trees in fact, can grow up to about 40 metres, so it's actually quite a young oak tree in that respect. And of course, with oak trees, uh, its spread can be as much as its height, so there's a long, a long way to go for it to grow. Its root spread could be up to three times its height. So this is quite a significant, uh, significant beast, if you like. So I want to first examine the question of immunity for the oak. We've heard uh, Mr. Payton talking about the immunity assessment earlier. This uh, oak tree is effectively, uh, much of it is screened from Peachfield Road by this integrated garage and greenhouse complex and in between or behind that, to the north of that again, there's uh, some screening from a clump of, of mixed evergreens. So it's really only partially visible from Peachfield Road. You can see a bit of it. Uh, and what you don't see from the photographs in actual fact is when you visit it, you see that there's actually a drop down in the land. So when you go back down into that back garden area, you've actually dropped down quite a number of feet. So this is set down it feels almost in a hall, and the visibility or the sense that what you're looking at is actually not achieved by looking at it from Peachfield Road. So the really, uh, is with any other direction in which you can actually see this, was there's a lane running through to Fruitlands to what used to be the nursery, which I used to use when, uh, when going, going and picking up hanging baskets and the like there. But there's a hedge line there. You can't actually see it, uh, the tree from that side. So the eastern side, there's this lane. It's, it's screaming what's going on in the garden. You can't really see over towards uh, where the other side of it, the northwest side where, the, where this oak tree is. So the only way to properly see the tree 
is from the back garden areas of number 26 and number 28. Uh, and it cannot therefore be said to be a public community within the conservation area, as it is not really visible to the public. In the, uh, the tree preserve, the TPO report that Chris has produced in para 4.4, if you would wish to, to look at that, he says uh, in that the report, it says that the, um, the oak and lime were of sufficient quality and level of public amenity to merit TPO protection. So let's uh, look at this a little bit further. The visibility of the oak from Peachfield Road is limited and it's not visible for any other area. And you can really only properly appreciate it from the back area of numbers 26 and 28. So it doesn't seem to offer really any public amenity from that point of view. The question of the amenity assessment uh, that was done, uh, Mr. Payton came up and, and has said that uh, they've just had a sight of this uh, today, I think he said it was, and it scored 15.5, which is just marginally above the 50, which would mean it would be acceptable to be benchmark this uh, as, a, as a TPO. And I understand that Dr. Barnes has, uh, and maybe Mr. Payton as well, I'm not sure which one, but probably Dr. Barnes has gone through this um, uh, Heliwell method that is partially used or is used in terms of the amenity assessment and has actually come up uh, looking at the, the scoring and looking at the definitions of the Heliwell method uh, has come up with a different score, which to some extent, of course, these scores are subjective, but this different score is 11 and a half, well below the, the level which would trigger a TPO of 15. And there are the core differences, there are four core differences uh, which she identified. Uh, and any one of these core differences, if the, the scoring, and there's a disagreement here a, uh, about the scoring between uh, Chris Lewis Barley's scoring and Dr. Barnes's, because they're quite distinctively different. That any one of. Councillor Gallagher, I, could I just point out you've gone well over your five minutes? Um, I, shall, I shall try. Thank you. Thank you, John. So there's a difference there. So taking uh, any one of the off take out, you would drop the amenity score from the red oak well below the TPO level. On the question of shading from the oak, turn to uh, the photograph in 318 of the report. You will see in, the, in uh, that, you will see a shadow that's actually, it that looks like it's if about midday. I don't know what time of year it is, but you will see a shadow for, uh, right in the middle from the oak tree. And it's just, uh, the shadow was just past number 26, Dr. Barnes' house. So in the morning, it would mean that that very long shadow has been a significant impact on Dr. Barnes' house. The shadow is now from the midday point, it will be moving over the greenhouse and glass complex. And so therefore, uh, as a material aspect in, uh, in for uh, accepting the TPO, the shadowing there can seem to be... Councillor Gallagher, you, you, you're very well over your five minutes now. Could I ask you to um, finish your presentation, please? Okay, let me finish off with the, the, other, the other one, which is uh, the, the, when I visited this, the, the site to look at the lime and the uh, Acer compressed or the field maple, I saw that they were very close together and it seems reasonable to me that uh, they would, that there's some, some adjustment of that spacing, either one removal or another should be done. Can I propose, can I put two proposals together? One is that the, uh, or the basis of what I've just been arguing, that the oak, the red oak actually should be removed and allow Mr. Payton to plant up the rest of his arboretum. And for, uh, for a decision to be made about whether it is justifiable to remove either the lime or the field maple, uh, that what it would be of benefit for the actual uh, 
for that area of the garden and for, for the amenity, that one of them should be allowed to flourish and that should be left to discussion between the officer, the owner and the ward councillors. So there's two, pro two proposals that I'm proposing now. Thank and you. I'll include that. Thank you, Councillor Gallagher. Could I just, um, for, conf for confirmation, when you say be removed, do you mean be removed from the confirmation of the tree preservation order? You don't mean physically be removed, just for clarity. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Okay. Um, Councillor Died, would you like to say a few words? Thank you. Yeah, I'll be, sorry, Chair, yeah, I'll try and be brief because obviously we are running quite late. I've made a few notes. Um, I want to thank the officer as well for the report. Um, and I also must mention that the timely response because I, I'm finding it difficult with work to get a lot of these, these things done. And I only asked him the scores last night and he got back to me this morning with those. So I want to thank him for that. Uh, I know he's a very busy man because he has to cover a lot of, of, of area. Maybe that's something that as a council we can look to giving him some assistance in the future. Um, very briefly then and very quickly, um, the scoring system is something that I think is open to question, and this isn't uh, in relation to the officer's scoring. I think the way we score the system, there are too many subjective markers in there. Um, I, I did an assessment which came out lower than the officer's assessment, and I'm not saying I'm right, I'm just saying because of, there were some subjective markers in there, I've scored differently to him. So I do think materially, and it's unfortunate that we've got an IT problem tonight because it would have been great if the officer maybe could have stepped through those scores with us so we all had a better understanding of them. Um, again, this isn't a go at Chris. I, I know Chris does his work very seriously, but I probably don't understand how he scores them. It would have just been beneficial for me and maybe the other members of the committee. So we've had an IT issue there. Um, with, so with regards to the T1 tree, which is the oak, I think John's right. There's a lot of shading shown on that photograph, which to me looks quite significant. And having visited the property, you do get a different perception of the tree's impact when you're standing in the back garden looking at it. I think um, Mr. Payton's made some really good moves. He, he actually has uh, quite a significant um, little orchard going on uh, uh, and uh, he's added some really interesting species of trees. So I think he's very genuine when he when he when he says he's a tree person as well. I don't think he just you know agrees with he wants to, wants to cut a tree down. So I think Mr. Payton's uh, quite genuine in in, in um, maybe wanting to deal with this tree because of the peculiarities of it. I think the other thing is is the group of trees. Um, I looked at them in daylight and thought that they were interfering with each other's growth. But having spoken to Chris, I'm quite happy that that, that they're not interfering with each other and can stay as a group. So I've got a slightly different proposal to Councillor Gallagher, and I would propose that we keep the grouping of trees in the TPO and remove the oak T1 from the TPO. Um, I'm not sure if that's a possible thing we can do this evening or not. Uh, so as I say, I, I've got the benefit of visiting the site, standing in the back garden, speaking to Mr. Payton and looking at what Chris has done. And that's just the conclusion I've drawn. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Dye. There was quite a lot um, to digest there. Um, just to go back to Councillor Gallagher, um, John, what I, what I think you said, but I'd like you to confirm, is that um, you would like to propose that the red oak isn't uh, confirmed as part of the TPO, but that there is a discussion to be had uh, between ward members, owner and, and Chris with regard to the uh, field maple and the lime. Is that correct? Yes. I, I, whether, whether indeed, well, the question remains the field maple and lime as to whether it should be subject to a TPO, whether one of them should be removed or not. Okay. And it's interesting to have that discussed at committee. So what okay. Thank you, John. Um, Councillor Died, you you made a, a slightly different um, proposal, which was uh, that the field maple and the lime should remain and be confirmed in the TPO, uh, but that the oak should be removed. So that's what I have, I think, on the yeah. table at the moment. Councillor Died, is that as I right. 
Is that correct? Uh, yeah, sorry, Chair. I, I, I probably confused it. I mean, I'm happy to go with John's recommendation if you, if you think it's worth I, I, I'd probably just jump the gun a little bit and, and think I've had that conversation with everybody. Um, but I'm happy to have that conversation again and go with John's recommendation that we remove T1 but keep the group for a, a future discussion just between the ward members and the tree officer and, and the residents concerned. So okay, I'll give it to your you. discretion, Chair. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll come back to it um, later. Um, could I ask Chris, because there were, there were quite a lot of um, questions there, Chris, and, and a few comments, and I know you haven't got your, your access to your uh, papers properly, but are you able to uh, respond on that and to um, make some comments for me, please, and for members? Thank you, Chairman. In terms of the proposal, um, the, the decision that, that you have before you today is either confirmation or non-confirmation. Um, however, there is a, 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 a middle ground which is um, in line with uh, what Councillor Dyer is saying and kind of in line with what Councillor Gallagher is saying, which is to confirm the, the tree preservation order subject to modification, uh, which would mean that um, uh, T1 uh, uh, would not be part of the TPO going forward, uh, but, but G1 would. Now, uh, I think the, the, the only other option is, is to uh, confirm the TPO excluding T1 and then divide, choose one or the other, the lime or the maple. I, th I think probably for simplicity, um, it, it would, the, 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 the best way forward would be to confirm the TPO on G1 and then as, as Councillor Gallagher has suggested, uh, conversations between uh, uh, Councillor Gallagher and Councillor Dyed and the, and the tree owners happen at some future date. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Does that does that help with that particular aspect? I'm not sure if it helps really, Chris, or, or makes it worse in some ways. Um, I, I can see what you're saying. Yes, um, and of course we mustn't forget that um, the TPO doesn't um, doesn't preclude tree works taking place. Um, after the TPO has been confirmed, of course. So, um, you know, no, that's yeah. something else to think about, isn't it? Um, not that I'm trying to guide the debate at all, but just to be just to clear that up that a TPO doesn't prohibit tree work. So, I will um, open this up to members, please. Um, just looking at hands, I've got um, Councillor Bennett. Yes, um, it doesn't have to be an either or. Um... <laughs> I, 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 you know, that red oaks um, are absolutely wonderful trees and there is, I know this area well, I used to live in it, I used to walk up and down that road all the time and the trees in that area are exceptionally valuable to Malvern um, and um, I think it is an absolute travesty that this would be completely cut down. I would hope that that T1 could be trimmed um, I'm sorry, but I don't accept that it actually blocks light out in certain places because I know the orientation of that road very well. And um, let's face it, the sun goes down behind the hills when you're that high up quite a lot. So there's not much shading in the afternoon. So, you know, I'm sorry, some of this, some of this is very um, <coughs> um, subjective. Let's put it that way. Um, the tree um, has been there for a number of years. The owner of the tree has said that they've been there for 35 years and I would hope that there could be some middle ground and the tree could be saved and just um, some sensible works could be done on it to make sure that we don't lose something that is I mean let's face it oaks are one of the most prized trees that we have in this country and they should be preserved where it is at all possible. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ben. I think I have Councillor Davis. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I must confess to being confused about the motion that we're debating right now. Um, uh, but can I ask a question for clarification, please? Uh, and that is, is, is there a time constraint on, uh, on the uh, establishment of uh, permanence for these uh, tree preservation orders? Chairman, if I may, uh, in it, putting aside the, uh, uh, the confusion about the motion for one moment, uh, 
yes is the answer. Um, uh, a decision on the confirmation or otherwise uh, needs needs to be made this evening, I'm afraid, uh, Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, <clears throat> well, in, in, in that case, um, I, I was going to suggest that there, if there were no time constraints, we might want to defer this in order to tidy up what decision we're actually seeking to make here. Um, uh, but but in, in that situation, then uh, I'll state my position having... Uh, listen to the debate tonight and and having uh, looked at these trees, albeit not in leaf today, um, uh, my, my view would be that uh, the tree preservation order on the trees at the front, G2, uh, G1, uh, is is uh, retained uh, and uh, and not re uh, established on on T1. Thank you, Councillor Davis. I think. That is sort of where uh, Councillor Gallagher and Councillor Died were getting to, but I'll, I'll come back to it all at the end. Councillor Nielsen. Thanks very much. Um, well, I uh, also went to visit uh, Mr. Payton and Dr. Barnes and viewed the tree from inside the garden, uh, Mr. Payton's garden. And um, I can confirm that uh, actually it is very different and I would have to disagree very fundamentally with uh, Councillor Bennett on the impact of the light. Because if you look at uh, the picture, the Google Earth picture shown on page 67, you can see a very, con you can see not only the compass and therefore the direction of light from east to west and the impact of that shadowing on both number 26, Dr. Barnes property and also um, Mr. Payton's property. It travels, uh, the arc of the shadow travels over the property in number 26 and over the greenhouse of Mr. Payton in number 28. Mr. Payton ha didn't have time to say, but he was able to say to me that actually he would have to remove his greenhouse from that location because of the increased shading of the tree, which has clearly grown over the years, over the period of the 35 years, was appropriate to scale, but is no longer uh, appropriate to its location and to the scale of that situation. And in removing his greenhouse, he won't be able to continue his tree planting. So we would be potentially preserving a tree and obviously uh, not actually increasing the trees in that area, uh, thanks to Mr. Payton's planting. I do think that the shadowing from what I could see looking at the site was a very considerable issue for the private amenity of the residents of number 26 and 28. And that is uh, really what they, what they were worried about here. And I did not think that uh, very good as the report was from our tree officer that that came through in it. I also think that while something might be appropriate at one point in time, it becomes inappropriate potentially at another point in time. And of course, this tree can grow very considerably still and therefore would be uh, inconveniencing in terms of uh, the light amenity, the residents of 26 and 28 further. I would also say that you can see the trees in terms of public amenity from Peachfield Road, as Councillor Bennett points out, but you can't see them from the bridal way. You can't see uh, you can't see the red oak from the bridal way, and you can't see anything from the Wells Road. So I would think that the amenity, the public amenity of that tree, is actually very limited. Thank you, Councillor Nelson. Have I got um, um, other speakers, please? Um, I can't see any other hands up at the moment. So. Um, okay. We've got a proposal to um, sort of split the decision on the TPO. And I'm not sure actually if we are able to do that, are we? Um, Chris or Chris, would you, you like to say a few words? Yeah. As, it, the, the, the decision for us today is, is either confirmation of the uh, uh, TPO as is, um, 
not confirming uh, the TPO at all, as in not protecting any of the trees, uh, or the middle ground is confirming the TPO uh, subject to modifications. Now, what those modifications are, that's, that's the crux of the matter. Um, it seems um, at the moment uh, that Councillor Gallagher and Councillor Died are in agreement that uh, T1, as in the red oak, um, should not be part of the TPO. Um, but there's, there's, a, there's a certain amount of uh, uncertainty as to the other part. Uh, um, so, uh, as, as I said, you either would need to um, confirm the, t the TPO in, in regard to G1, uh, either on the lime or, the, or on the red maple, uh, incidentally, which is not a field maple. Uh, so either, either confirm the TPO on one of those uh, or, on, or on both of those, uh, the, the lime and, the, uh, and the, 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 the red maple, which forms part of G1. So uh, I, I hope that provides some clarity. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> um, we do have some fun, don't we, with trees? Um, Councillor Gallagher, I'm, I'm going to come back to you um, to start with, and then I'll come back to Mark. Um, would, I don't know if I'm allowed to do this, Penny might tell me off. Um, would it be acceptable um, for the tree preservation order to be confirmed with a modification of taking out T1, which is the red oak? This is as your proposal, I mean, I'm not saying this is what would happen, but as your proposal, but that we would um, confirm group two, so the two trees, but that Chris would then be in consultation with um, the owner about um, pruning or future tree management works. I'm just thinking, is that a way forward? Um, Duncan, Chris, anybody want to, either of you want to come back in? Thank you, Chairman. Um, before I do, though, I, I think Chris may want to, okay. to mention Thank something. You. Chris, would you like to come back in? No, it was just that um, uh, 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 Chairman, you yourself said that, um, or highlighted the fact that um, uh, the presence of a tree preservation order doesn't doesn't mean no work. Uh, it just means that what works um, uh, take place in the future are uh, um, uh, under the control of the uh, of the district council. Um, so if the TPO was um, confirmed, uh, keep, keeping the lime and the uh, red uh, and the maple uh, as part of the order, then an application for something could be made uh, to uh, one or other of those trees in the future. And um, that, that application could be considered in the um, uh, uh, collaboration with uh, uh, councillors Gallagher and Died, if that's a, that is a, a way out of this conundrum. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Um, Kieran, did you want to come in and say something? I, I was just going to try and add a bit of um, clarity on what how I understood the uh, the motion from Councillor Gallagher to be honest. So um, I'm not sure if I'm going to help now, but I'll, I'll just in in what wide understood is that the T1 was not to be confirmed tonight um, as part of the order, um, but that the the group um, the group designation um, was not to be confirmed in in, in the sense that um, I think. One of the Council Gallagher was proposing that one tree would be retained, but the other one would be felled. But he was trying to leave it open for the for discussions to see which one happened. Um, so essentially, it so, so, so essentially that would happen at a later well, ha happen later. So he, he, he felt only one tree should actually be part of the tree preservation order, um, one of the, the uh, groups. But, um, I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not a tree officer, but I'm not sure we can confirm an order without saying which trees are actually subject to the order. But I'm going to hand back to Chris. Yeah. Chris. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yes, you're right, Kieran. You did confuse the issue slightly. Uh, and yes, you're right, uh, Councillor Wood. Um, we need to say what trees are being uh, protected as part of the confirmation of the order. So. Uh, okay. Yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, Duncan, did you want to add something before I go back to Councillors Gallagher and Di? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, th I think we've established that um, from what we've heard of the debate this evening, that there isn't much in the way of support for Tree T1, but clearly there are some members um, that feel that it should be retained. But Councillor Gallagher's motion is to not include Tree T1 as part of the TPO. Um, I think Councillor Died seconded that, but it would be helpful uh, I'm sure to Penny and Lisa, if he was in a moment, just to confirm whether that was the case. Um, like, like Kieran and Chris, I hope this is helpful. I think the situation that we have is that Councillor Gallagher was keen with his motion to delegate authority to the Director of Planning and Infrastructure so that there would be a discussion after this evening to decide whether it was the maple or the lime to be retained, but not both. Again, if Councillor Died is seconding the motion, it would be helpful if uh, the ward members could clarify that. I think as officers, um, you've heard that your tree officer is recommending that the lime is the better of the two. His recommendation to you is that the two trees should be remain should should uh, remain? But if having carefully considered his recommendation, your view is that only one should be retained. I think it might be helpful this evening if Councillor Gallagher could indicate which of the two trees he thinks should be retained, and then whether Councillor Gallagher agrees and can second that motion. I think that would make. Uh, the situation a lot easier for the whole committee this evening. You then have a clear motion on which to vote. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Died would second. Um, yeah, okay. Um, I'll go back to Councillor Gallagher then. Uh, Councillor Gallagher, um, at the moment, uh, we think the motion on the table is that uh, the TPO is confirmed on one of the G g1 trees but at the moment we don't know which one um would you like to uh either reconsider the the way you word in the motion or um give me some clear guidance please on how you would like this motion to be put to the members uh thank you chair i i think what duncan has said uh is uh, accords with what i was trying to Get across the point about the lime and the field maple. I'm not in a position to judge as to which of those should be the ones that would retain. If you were to remove one, which one should you remove? But I, for the sake of the motion, can I? Is it, uh, is it sensible for me to say that the field maple is the one that should be retained? I would ask Chris Farley if he thinks the field maple is uh, sufficiently uh, robust, if it's of a su sufficient quality, shall we say, uh, to be retained, or whether the much larger lime tree should be retained. So I, I would like to take advice on that. Chair, if I may, um, as, ex as explained in the report, um, it, 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 is, it is my opinion that uh, if the lime were removed, then we would be left with a, a very unsightly looking tree in the remaining maple. Um, hence hence the, the, the group designation. Um, it, it is also my uh, strong opinion that uh, ni neither tree should be removed um, because of, I mean, uh, as you saw in the photos, they form a, a very strong uh, a collective outline um, and are, are therefore of, uh, uh, um, of benefit together as a, as, a, uh, as a group rather than as in individuals. I think uh, that it would be to the detriment of either um, to remove one or the other. Um, Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. I'll come, I'll come back. Um, I was just going to go back to Councillor Died actually. Um, I can see a couple of other members with hands up, but I'd just like to go back to um, Councillor Dyde as the ward member. Um, Councillor Dyde, could I have 
um, a view from you, please. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. And, and again, I, I, having spoken to Chris, um, and I think Chris has just reiterated a similar conversation we've had. Uh, in my opinion, I would look to remove T1 from the TPO, but keep the grouping in um, because the trees, I believe, after the officer's recommendation, are not uh, harmful to each other. So um, that was where, it's, I, and I'll apologise for any confusion there, where myself and, and Councillor Gallagher probably had the slight difference in that. Um, I I'm, was happy for the two trees to continue to grow in that space on the basis that the tree officer, who is far more experienced than me, believes that they're happy to coexist in that space. Thank you, Councillor Dyer. OK, I've got a couple of questions. I can see Councillor Davis and Councillor Allen. Councillor Davis. Uh, yes, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I would really struggle if we were having to vote uh, on uh, on on let's say the the uh, re retention of T1 and the retention of one of the t trees in in because because I'm in favour of uh, retaining uh, of uh, disposing of tree T1, but I'm in favour of retaining both of the trees, and I couldn't come to make a judgment on which of those trees uh, we should uh, we should retain if the group was to be broken up. I, I, I think Councillor Dyde's suggestion is perfectly adequate, quite straightforward. If we retain the tree preservation order on the group of trees, then the, the landowner and the local members can have conversations with Chris Lewis Farley, who I'm sure will be amenable to discuss how best to manage those two trees. My view is that they should be allowed to continue to uh, to, to exist together. Uh, I, I can't see that they're unhappy in that situation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Councillor Allen? Yes, good evening. Thank you. I'm sorry, I think this is quite shambolic to, to some extent. Um, it, it would have been very helpful if, if ward members had come forward with some concrete proposals at the start. Uh, I, and to some extent, I'm totally confused on G1 and G2. Um, some people seem to want to keep both of them. Some people are happy for one to go, but they're not sure which one to go. So my preference at the moment is that I, I think the T1 should go and we should vote on that. And, and we should defer on the other two to give the ward members a chance again to speak to the officer uh, and to actually come back and, make, you know, come back to us with some concrete proposals because we're making it up on the hoof at the moment and I, I don't think that's helpful or constructive of what we should be doing so I, I will happily vote uh, for uh, T, T1 to go and I think that with the other two I'm going to abstain because I, I'm not prepared to vote on something that, that we, we're just making it up as we go along. Thank you. Councillor Allen. Uh, sorry, <clears throat> sorry um, Chair, I'd just like to clarify that there is only one, um, there is only one TPO to be um, voted on this evening. Um, there isn't two votes to be taken. No, and, 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 and there is only two, um, Councillor Allen, there, there is the individual red oak, which is the one it, down the gardens, if you like, bordering, and there is the group of two, which I think is, is it G1, Chris? Yeah, G1 at the front, which is the lime and the maple. So at the moment, we, I think, well, several members who've spoken uh, 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 have said about T1, but there's also the, the G2, which is the one where the two trees are grown together. So the lime and the maple are grown together. So I don't think there's confusion over, over those. I think the, the confusion is possibly over uh, how we deal with those two, that G2, at least that G1 group, which is the two trees. So I'm, I'm going to, Chris, did you want to say any more? Otherwise, I'm going to go back to the ward members. No, OK. Councillor Gallagher, um, if I could come back and Councillor Di, because you've both got a slightly different view on this. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth because I shouldn't do, really. But um, would you be happy with, because um, we're going to have to vote on this, obviously, and I want members to be really clear on what they're voting on. Obviously, the officer's recommendation is that the TPO is com confirmed as it is. So that's T1 and G1, both trees in G1. But both yourself and Councillor Dyed as ward members are suggesting that T1, the red oak, um, is not part of the confirmation of the TPO. Um, but I have a slight difference in the way we deal with 
G1. My suggestion, otherwise we could be here all night, um, if you're happy with this, and Penny, am I okay to do this? I'm not overstepping the market chair, am I? <laughs> Um, I'm just, Penny? Um, no, I'm, I'll, I'll let you say what you're going to say and okay. then I'll come back if you don't want to. I was going to suggest that if we have a difference of opinion between the two ward members, admittedly not a big difference, but there is a difference, that um, if Councillor Gallagher was happy with this, um, bear in mind that a TPO doesn't, it, it isn't um, something that is a permanent thing, it can be changed. What I was going to suggest is that we um, confirm the TPO on, on G1, which is the lime and the maple, but that we, um, modif so we modify the order in that sense, we've taken out T1, but that we agree that, and, and if you would propose this, this would be great, uh, that you and Councillor Died um, propose that um, discussions then take place between Chris, the owner, and a delegated decision to uh, the director of um, planning and infrastructure um, as to what happens with that G1 group. So, you know, potentially some works to, to, to the G1 group. Um, I'm not sure if I've got that quite right. Um, Penny, did you want to come in at this point? Yeah, um, sorry, Chair. My understanding is that at this point in time, you've got two different proposals. Um, the first made by Councillor Gallagher that you just outlined to remove T1 and then to delegate the decision on the group. Um, as I understand it, Councillor Dyde was actually trying to propose the latter, which it, um, the latter option, um, which is to remove, simply to remove um, T1, but then to confirm the TPO, including G G1, the group. Um, yeah, yeah, okay, that's fine. Yeah, I'm going to go back to Councillor Died. Um, so Councillor Died um, and Councillor Gallagher, I suppose. Um, Councillor Died, would you be would you be happy um, to propose or second what we've just said about uh, the, the keeping in the G two, basically? <laughs> and yeah, yeah, certainly. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. There, I was just going to say uh, my understanding is. Uh, our tree officer has pointed out that having a TPO on a tree doesn't mean that further work can't be undertaken. So my understanding was that if you put the TPO on the pair of trees, one of them still could be cut down at some point in the future. So I, that's where I was coming from. I felt that that offer was sort of met all the, the necessary criteria. So. Okay, thank you. Um, so if I, if I could go back to Councillor Gallagher as, um, uh, as, as first proposer, if you like, Councillor Gallagher. Sorry, I'm terribly sorry, Chair. I think I need to cut in here. Um, I think we've got two different proposals and what we need is for somebody to second either Councillor Gallagher's um, proposal or Councillor Dives. Um, right, I'll, I'll, try, I'll, second jo I'll second John's. Just let John propose. And I'll, we'll need, we'll, we move this on. I'll, I'll, if John proposes, I'll second. Okay, Councillor Gallagher, you want to make your proposal? Yes, I, I, I'd make the proposal on the basis of removing T1 and having further discussions about the, the G1 uh, and, and how to deal with that, whether one needs to be removed or which one should be removed. And we could have uh, take that between the ward members uh, and the officer and, have, and the owner of the property to, to resolve that issue. Okay, so my understanding Chris, is that we would uh, confirm the TPO with modifications, which is that T1 would not be confirmed as part of the TPO, but that G1 would be confirmed. I'm not quite sure how we deal with the wording in terms of the, um, if you like, the post TPO com confirmation conversations. Duncan, have you got a, uh, some words we could use, please? Chairman, I'm sorry about this, but what Councillor Gallagher has just said um, really causes us some difficulty. Councillor Gallagher, we need you to be really clear this evening. We're absolutely clear that T1 is not confirmed as part of the, T as, of, of the TPO, but what you went on to say was that there would be some discussion afterwards about what happens to G1. We need you to, to be very clear and confirm this evening. Is your motion that the TPO is confirmed on G1? I'm going to pause at that moment. And that 
as in any situation, after a TPO has been confirmed, a tree owner can avail themselves of the council services that are with the tree officer and seek advice on works to a tree that is protected by a TPO as opposed to removal of that tree. I hope that's helpful. We do need you to be clear. Is your motion to confirm the TPO on G1? Thank you. Yeah, uh, having listened to that, yes, I think that would be uh, the sensible way to resolve this is to confirm that the motion is to remove T1 and confirm uh, the TPO on G1. Okay, thank you. I think that's clear now then. And uh, um, Councillor Dyde, you're happy to second that? Yes, Chair, I am. Thank you. Okay, so we we have a, a motion on the table, therefore, which we would need to go to the vote on uh, as the first vote, correct, Penny? Yes, that's which correct, is, Chair. Which is that we confirm the TPO with modification, so the TPO is confirmed on G1, but not on T1. Okay, is that clear? Yeah. Is that okay, Duncan? Correct? Thank you, Chairman, yes. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to go to vote the vote on that first and see if that uh, um, gets passed. Um, so Penny, could I ask you to uh, call out the members' names, please? And ask Certainly. them to vote. Thank you, Chair. Um, again, councillors, I'll call out your name and if you could say very clearly whether you're voting for, against or abstaining, confirming the modified TPO. So, Councillor Axar. Abstain. Councillor Allen. For. Councillor Behan. Against. Councillor Bennett. Against. Councillor Bovey. For. Councillor Chan? For. Councillor Davis? For. Councillor Dyde? For. Councillor Gallagher? For. Councillor Mills? For. Councillor McVeigh? Against. Councillor Morgan? For. Councillor Nielsen? For. Councillor Palmer? For. Councillor Rain. Against. Councillor Reid. Against. Councillor Whitehead. For. And Councillor Wood. Abstain. <laughs> One moment, please. Okay, that is. 11 in favour of the modified confirmation, five against with two abstentions. So the modified order is confirmed. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, that was a difficult one. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody who's spoken tonight and all the members of the public who've spoken as well. Um, so if we could um, close the meeting.